Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people looking to live life at their peak potential. Chock full of real world tools and knowledge that you can apply in your life today. By providing you with a lens into the lives, beliefs, practices, and actions of those who are already living extraordinary lives, the Performance Enhancing Podcast will help you shift your mindset or create that change in your daily rituals and habits so you can explode with success in the areas of life that are most important to you. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another performance enhancing podcast with your host, Elon Ferdman. So today we're going to delve into part two of my interview with Nick Gray, the man who answered, what would you do if money was no object with one of the coolest career paths? And today specifically, we talk more technical information, things like how to hire the perfect employee. So a cool little tool that they use and how that helps them hire the perfect person a sneaky body language trick for when you're in sales or just interacting with other human beings, which all of you should be. We're also gonna look at a Twitter ads strategy that Nick and his team have implemented that has been incredibly successful. And that also segues into a conversation about why you wanna promote to your highest value customer. And then lastly, which was one of my favorite quotes in the last few months here, Nick shared a quote, that I'm going to paraphrase, but basically said, if you're not embarrassed by your first product, then you have waited too long to launch it. And I just think that that's a brilliant life lesson in general, not just in business, getting on the field and actually playing the game. So without taking any more of your time, let's jump into part two of my interview with Nick Gray. So, okay. So you start doing this, which is really, really cool. And I know your the way that you kind of do this is it's very entertainment driven. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's big time entertainment driven. We believe that in museums today, and this just goes with like the culture, people like you and me, if you are not entertained, then you are tuning out, right? Yes. So we say before you can educate, you have to entertain. And so we try to hook them with the funny stories and the very engaging tour guides who focus on making a connection and getting people to have fun, moving very fast. That's one thing that's special about our tours. We see on average two to three times as many objects as the average museum tour. Our mm -hmm. tours move incredibly fast. Hmm. So people, fe people feel like they're, they're getting their, money, their money's worth. How do you find people to run these tours? Because you obviously are not doing it on your own anymore. Right. I'm not doing it on my own anymore. We've hired a lot of amazing guides who are fantastic. We have guides with a very diverse background and we post online on all different places. We post on social media. We post on Craigslist. We post on um, Broadway actor places. And that lets us hire science teachers and storytellers and theater staff. Uh, but I think one thing that's special is how we do our job interviews that maybe not everybody does, but that could be helpful to someone who's, like, who's listening out there. Uh, we use an applicant tracking system to receive all of our resumes. And there's a lot out there, but the one that we use is called the Resumator. And that lets us spread our resources and our job postings super wide, as wide as we can, so that we can receive 300 resumes and it puts it all into one web login system. We then go into the web login system and we can very quickly like sort of like a, um, sort of like a Tinder of online resumes. We can like choose yes or no on people that will win out about half of them. And then we call everybody in for a live interview. Hmm. We, we spice them up. So they're about 10 per hour. And we bring them into the museum and what we're looking for is people who are charismatic, who have good body language, who can really kind of do storytelling. So we do a quick activity that they don't know about. We say, welcome to the museum. We're glad you're here for the interview. You have 10 minutes to run around this room, find a piece that you love, use your smartphone to write a quick one minute story about it. And using that way in a day, we can go through 75 people and we can immediately see who's resourceful, who can think on the fly. 
And that helps us from 300 applicants narrow down to maybe two or three that we hire. Amazing. Now you brought up body language. So I just want to stick to that. Is that something that you've studied now that you're, that you were doing this? I haven't formally studied it, but I've probably read some of the same books that you have. What's your favorite like body language resource? I'd love to get some advice. Well, we, we may have even read the same one. I, uh, I fell in love with Joe Navarro is what everybody is saying. I, yeah, I love that book. So that was, you know, that was kind of my entrance into it. And then I've noticed that a lot of the NLP guys and a lot of the sales guys, um, I just did, uh, you know, Jordan Belfort, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, I've heard about it. Okay. So the guy that the movie was based off of like Boiler Room, same, yeah. same guy. Um, he has a program called Straight Line Selling which I'm actually going through right now. And he is also, you know, in sales, body language. It's crazy. He said the stat, 9% of language is words. Just 9%. 91% is tonality and body language. So nonverbal. Wow. And uh, just, just one quick thing, which I thought was really interesting. I never heard before. If you're even picking up, like say you even, when you're selling a woman or a man, different. So, um, and you could even be selling a woman on a date, right? Same thing. So for a woman, you want to stand two and a half feet away from them. If you stand any closer, you're in their space and it's an automatic turnoff. Wow. So very, very, when you meet someone, very important with a woman to keep your distance and make sure that your body is fully facing her. So like you're, you're face to face, not kind of like side like this. Yeah. Because that that's how they believe that someone has presence and, and is powerful and, and all the things that they're looking for hmm. on the opposite side. If you're trying to sell a man, never stand face to face with the man Whoa. because it's confrontational, almost like two animals coming head to head. So wow. when you're trying to sell a man, very important to actually be kind of more to the side of him. So just things like that. I really, really enjoy. Um, that's awesome. Just from understanding. So yeah, big into body language. So I thought it was funny that you brought that up. Um, but these people going back to the people that you hire, they don't necessarily have the skills or the knowledge on what is happening in the museum. How do you guys wrap them in that knowledge so that they can actually go out there and do this for people? A lot of the guides, by the way, are way smarter than I am. And it's a big <laughs> reason that I lead very few, if any, of the tours anymore. Um, but they know about art history. They know about storytelling but maybe they don't know about the museum itself as, as well as I know all the nooks and crannies and the favorite spots. So we do really like an immersion program where they have to shadow a lot of our tours. Mm. And we certainly have a lot to learn about how to train our staff, but um, I've had a couple colleagues help out, mainly my one guy named Mark, who's done an amazing job bringing on so many people but we really do a sink or swim policy where they got to just get thrown into the fire and start to shadow our tours and help out and figure it out. Interesting. Immersion learning. Immersion learning. Very avant-garde. Um, okay. So this business starts going, you start hiring these people. How do people find out about you? How do you get the word out? I know you mentioned the one article before that, but that was when you were solo. Yeah. How do you grow this business? I think you just told me right before that, in the last, how many months the business has doubled? In the last, since you and I talked last, which was probably about four months ago, maybe five months. Yeah, the business has probably doubled. And it's doing well because we've got a product that I believe is really 10x better than the traditional museum tour. And because of that, people want to tell their friends. And that's why the majority of all of our sales comes from word of mouth. People... Mm who go on the tour and they're like, this is awesome. When you come to New York, you have got to do this. You're like the Uber of uh, museum tours. You're like changing the game. <laughs> That's a high compliment because I like that service. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, right? People take for granted something like taxi service and it's like, that's just the way it is. And then this one guy comes along and goes, fuck that, this is stupid. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. There's got to be a better way, right? Yeah, and just create and, this whole system. Now they're all, they're all like, oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? Right. Now, I should state that the regular free museum tours totally work for some people, right? Yeah. Like they're great and there's these docents and they give them. But 
I'm coming around here saying, you know what? There's some people out there who are this ADD generation who have really high expectations, one, and number two, they're willing to pay for that. Yep. And I think that for new business owners and people who are looking to start things up, there's a whole group of people that are willing to pay for premium services that big companies cannot address. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have to move too fast to address them. And right. by the time they got through all the bureaucracy, um, before we kind of talk about like more technical ways on how you grew your business, I'm curious, were there one or two things that you can share with the listeners as you built this passion based business that, were just monumental learning experiences for you where you're like, Oh God, I just, I wish I did this differently. Yes. I could talk about two of those and both of them have to do with this theme of, uh, thinking that I needed something much bigger and better than I actually mm, needed. Great. Uh, the first one was about when we first started to do our corporate sales, and trying to do kind of like company team building tours at the museum, which has become hugely popular for us. Huge companies like Google and Adobe bring their staff to us and we have fun mm. at the museum. When we started it though, I thought that I needed someone who came from the consulting world, someone who had experience leading, you know, brand strategy brainstorming sessions. And that was a very expensive mistake for me because what I really needed was someone who could speak very excitedly and passionately about the museum and who had the grit to just kind of hustle that side of the sales. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a huge learning thing for me and it just wasn't the right fit for the business at the time. So you did hire this person? I did hire this person. They were working for us and it ultimately did not end up working out. Interesting. Why do you think it did not work out? I think just a complete different mash of expectations, thinking that I needed this consulting MBA level experience versus what I really needed was someone who was not afraid to grab the telephone and make, you know, five dozen cold calls before lunch to just like roll sales and focus on sales. Like that's what a business needs, right? Like that's the number one most important thing for a new business. Sales, baby. Sales. Okay. And what was the second thing? Second thing was once again, reaching higher than it was. I needed to, to work with a lawyer to help me with some restructuring of our business. And I, I kind of got scared and I, I went in, I got a referral to a very expensive lawyer. Long story short, these guys totally sweet talked me. And I ended up probably throwing five or ten thousand dollars that it just was not a good fit. They were trying to like do law stuff for my business, like these huge, huge. All I needed was you know a scrappy single lawyer guy who could do it all for me for a fifth of the price. <laughs> How many employees do you have right now? Today on payroll, we've got fifteen people. We also work with a fair number of independent contractors. Oh on top of the 15 standard, standard employees? On top of the 15. Now, not all those 15 are full-time. A lot of them work between 10 and 30 hours a week, but they are on payroll. They're W-2. We pay taxes on them. Yeah. <laughs> if the IRS is listening, we pay taxes. <laughs> yes. That is a huge thing for me. Nice. And are you strictly working in New York City right now? No, we're, that's exciting. We're growing to Washington, D.C., maybe to some other cities. And now we're finding that museums all around the world are hiring us to help train their docents and share some ideas with engaging millennials. Which, by the way, this is crazy. I've never taken an art history class. And it's just a new idea saying, I don't really like how museum tours are given. I want to do them in a whole new way. And now they're coming to you. Right. To find out how to do that. Yeah, which I'm like blessed and we have an amazing staff. This goes like way beyond just me. Our staff, they have art history degrees. They know about all this stuff. They're I just smart. think it's so cool. You know, a lot of people always ask me questions like, should I do this in my business or should I not? Should I take the business in this direction and or should I not? Mm. And my answer is usually one that they don't really like because it doesn't give them the answer and that really frustrates people. Right. 
just simply like always go back right your vision always go back to your mission statement does what you are intending to do fit with that why and in your case if three years ago i said hey nick what I'd like, what, what this business should look like is you go out and you train museums on how to run these tours. You'd be like, fucking kidding me? Like, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And here you are. Right. But, but it totally aligns with your vision. Yeah. That's a really good point to think about the mission and the vision. And I am very committed to that, to changing how adult museum tours are given because I want to go on fun museum tours when I come visit your town or wherever. Exactly. And I just think it's so cool that you do the work, whatever is necessary, right? And, and through the story, I hope people are, are getting that it takes something to jump off that cliff, which is always scary. Yeah. It takes something to go through the mental aspect of what you have to give up about how you know things and don't know things. Um, to grow the business, there, there's certain levels that you need to learn about, et cetera. But in the doing opportunities open up that will align with what your mission is. So I always share this story, which is really funny. When we started the business, all we wanted to do was life coach. Hey guys, I just want to take a quick break here and let you know about our 10 day challenge. All you have to do is head over to satoriprime.com backslash 10 day, the number 10 day. And in it, we give you a 10 part video series that is absolutely changing lives and it's completely free. It's a mindset shift in what is possible for you in your life right now. So I just want to read to you what someone has just written me and they said, what did the 10 day challenge create for me? In summary, a plan of action. A man with a goal and a plan is unstoppable. Your 10 day challenge allowed me to take all that confusion and fear of my situation and see it was a period of transition. I have a plan. I've taken action and I'm implementing. Success is just over the horizon. And that could be the case for you. So head over to satoriprime.com backslash 10 day, the number 10 day, and grab your 10 free videos today and create a plan of success for you. Now back to the episode. Somehow along the way, we became Facebook experts. Now, wow. if we were like, this has nothing to do with anything that we we're intending to do, then we would have potentially kibosh, you know, seven figures plus just, just because it didn't fit. But then we look back at our mission and our mission was to transform people's lives, mm. wake them up to live the best possible lives. You know what? Financially, people are struggling. So if I can show someone how to do something in a way that actually helps their business, helps their lives, that's still fulfilling on my mission. Yeah. And that's so I just love that people are open enough to see these other opportunities. And I think that's really cool for you and your, and your business. Hmm. Um, you, you said to me something before, and, and I don't know that we've spoken about this really here, but from a local business perspective, you said you've actually had a really good success with Twitter advertising. Oh yeah. Business. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about what you guys have been doing? Okay. So let me say this with Twitter ads and I'll talk about this, but we have gone after the highest, most valuable sector of our market. And that's where we've had success with. And what I consider that highest, most valuable is reaching out to other museum professionals hmm. to sell consulting contracts. Nice. And so if I was working as a, a small business or in another town besides New York City, I would look at the highest, most valuable type of users, small business owners, uh, high net worth individuals, and how, we've used the, uh, how we have used our ads on Twitter is to build a mailing list because Twitter has this thing where you can have Twitter cards and yep. they can subscribe to your list right from within the Twitter and you get their email address. They don't have to type it in or anything. And we've built a really cool list, very cost effectively. And Twitter has a special small business program where they will actually walk you through on the phone with a live kind of Twitter employee and they'll like help you set up your campaign. They'll call you back in a week to look at it. How's this performing? It was very helpful. And it's amazing. You know, we're on Facebook to get a rep. I mean, God knows. Impossible. Like, would never happen. Yeah. And even, even for them to talk to you, you would have to be spending somewhere in the vicinity of about, we've heard mixed numbers, but we've gathered somewhere in the vicinity of about like 8,000 plus a month. Wow. On Twitter, 
you could spend like a hundred bucks and you get that service. Exactly. Which is crazy. You know what? I'm going to actually leave a link guys in the resource guide for the small business program for Twitter. Uh, I think for, for local businesses and ha were they able to help you kind of find people localized to where you're looking or are you kind of doing more of like a blanket national thing? Yeah, we, so I got to be careful and say like, if you're just doing like, if you're opening a sandwich shop and you are doing Twitter ads, you know, I would be very careful because it's easy just to blow money away. We have said, look, buying followers doesn't mean anything, at least in my business. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I'm not trying to buy followers or favorites. I'm trying to buy their email address so that I can take over that channel. And that was my decision. That was not that was not like a Twitter thing that they came and said, Oh, what if you do this? That was me saying, Oh, this seems like gold. I'm going to go for it. So your the consulting clients are more people that you go and actually train, not people that you're doing uh, museum tours for. Right. The consulting clients is someone at a museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who says, look, we got a whole new group of docents coming in. Can you come in and do a four hour workshop? to train them on how to engage with millennials. So it's a much higher ticket item. Yeah, it's a much, much higher. Got yeah. it. So the investment makes sense, yeah. And by the way, how much do you charge for these, uh, these tours? The general tours that we do for the general public in New York start at $49 per person. Nice. And they go up to $89 for our top of the line nighttime VIP tour. Ooh, that sounds sexy. It's, even the, like the, it's the best one. It's like the best date night ever. Oh yeah. What, what is the, the, now I'm curious. See, like uh, he, just, he just did that marketing thing. Oh, good. First of all, there is wine involved. If you're someone who enjoys a museum with a little bit of alcohol uh, and it's, yeah, who doesn't it's held at night. Like you have like our top quality guides, you get a lot less customers. So smaller groups on average, it's four to six people per guide. Nice. So it's really yeah, it's like a private sort of experience. It's very nice. Only Friday nights? Only Friday and Saturday nights in New York City. Very, very cool. Okay, I might need to take you up on that one. You got to. I've been to, oh, man. Wine, wine at night in, in a museum. That, it, was it the Met? Which museum in the city recently shut down and did like a crazy expensive- Adult sleepover. sleepover. Yeah. The American Museum of Natural History. They killed it with that. They did a great job. Yeah. Were you invited? Were you involved? <laughs> we weren't invited. We weren't involved. They charged, I, I believe, $450 a head or maybe it was $350. But no, it was $450. $450 a head is a very expensive. It, look, that's the type of premium product that you can imagine internally they must have had debate about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it went well from what you've heard. Yeah. I think it went well. I mean, just so cool. They had like dinner and wine and you can hang out and run around the museum. It was a very small group of people. I think they only let something like 300 people in or. Yeah. It was a very cool idea. Interesting. Okay. So what's next for you guys? Where do you see this going? Uh, I'm interested, you know, just, I'm a simple guy. So just probably world domination. <laughs> um, can you just do one of these for me as you say? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about adult museum tours and I love great museums. So the more great museums that we can offer our tours at or help to give more engaging tours, the better. And we are entirely self-funded. I've never taken venture capital. I've never done a big loan. I've started these tours in my free time with hobbies, doing them on the weekends, and we've reinvested everything that we've made to help grow the company. So we're gonna keep our conservative, slow growth approach. And what's, what's the actual company name so people can, can find it? The name of my company is Museum Hack, H-A-C-K. Nice. And it's online. You can just search for it. We'd love to have you in New York City and soon in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Coming to a city near you. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you this, this final question we ask all the, the guests here. We kind of spoke about it, but maybe you'll have a, a different answer here. There's that cliche, I wish I knew then what I know now. And it sounds to me like between your previous job, leaving that job, starting this new thing, you've had some, some cool events and cool life experiences. Is there something you wish you would have known, say like 10, 15 years ago that you would have told yourself? 
Wow, that's a great question. And I wish I would have prepared a little bit better. For the most common thing that I see in new business owners is a focus on trying to perfect the product mm. before it's released. Do you meet people like this? Mm-hmm. And cash is king. And there's that great quote by, I think, Reed Hoffman, who says, if the first version of your product that you release, if you are not embarrassed by it, then you have waited too long to release it. I love that. I've never heard that quote before. I'm using it. It's good, right? And like, that's how I feel about our business. I'm really, really interested in short feedback loops and putting it out to the world as soon as possible. And I wish I would have done that a lot sooner. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's a great tip for life, period. Uh, imperfect action, what I call ignorance on fire, will outdo perfect action any day of the week. It's so funny, you know, you ask, is this something people deal with? One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they sit in the bleachers mm -hmm. looking at the game going, I would do this or I would do that or maybe I should do this. And I'm like, dude, get on the damn court, put on the damn sneakers, right. grab that ball, <laughs> shoot. Like, right. At least miss the rim by four feet, but shoot. Yeah. Crazy. So, yeah. so how long has this company been running? Museum Hack is coming up on two years and I've been doing free tours for my friends for three, maybe four years. Amazing. Amazing. I just, again, I, I, I love that you pursued a passion and for, again, for those guys watching Nick on video, it's like you get to live with a smile ear to ear. <laughs> or what happens? It's just, you're making a difference in the world in the mm -hmm. arena that you want to make the difference in the world. You're actually seeing it come to fruition. And kind of like you said right now, it's all because you just put it out there and let the world tell you do more or no thank you. Absolutely, right? Like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I never used to like museums. I thought they were stupid and boring. Something happened where I was like, I love these things. I'm interested in learning. I think these is where learning happens. And now I get to fly all around the world and go play in these amazing spaces and hopefully help a whole new type of audience share that same passion that I feel about. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Nick, uh, where can people grab a hold of you, connect with you, find out more about you? My website and the name of my company is called Museum Hack, museumhack.com. If anyone wants to shoot me an email, I'm nick at museumhack.com. And in, if any of your listeners ever come to the city and they want to go on one of our tours, just send me a note. I'm happy to make them VIP and hook them up with a little coupon code. Awesome. Nice. Good offer. Well, well worth the listen to the end. <laughs> nice. Nick, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your story. And uh, my final words to you, just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, the, the smile on your face says it all. <laughs> I, ca I cannot imagine that anyone walks out of these tours without that same grin ear to ear. We love the museum and it's so much fun to be able to share it with people. Amazing. Thank you so, so much for coming on and uh, good luck with everything. Museums are fucking awesome. <laughs> so if that doesn't get you pumped up, I don't know what will. Check your pulse. Nick Gray is just passion on fire. And if you're not passion on fire, then maybe now is a good time to just sit and look at what would it take, what would be a serious action step that you can take today and that might be as simple as making a list of what it is that you're passionate about. That might be in an exit strategy that you can implement to leave the job that you hate in the next six months. That might be reaching out to Guy and I to see what opportunities lie out there that you could pursue. Because I'm telling you, if you pursue something that you're passionate about, in a period of between three to five years, you can absolutely create at a base minimum a multiple six-figure and more likely an even multiple seven-figure business. It just takes you jumping off that cliff. It takes you taking the first step. So if you're watching this on YouTube, the link is there right below this video. For those listening in the car, very, very simple. 
It's satoriprime.com backslash 30 for 30. The number 30, F-O-R, 30. And that will give you a 30-minute consultation with myself personally. We can actually discuss what it is that you can pursue and how you can get it up and running very, very quickly. So until we meet again, have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you for joining us on this week's Performance Enhancing Podcast. We've taken this pep talk and created a custom action guide so you know exactly what action steps to take now to grow your business. Just head over to satoriprime.com slash podcast and download it for free. Also, please leave a comment and rate this podcast on iTunes. It'll help us get the word out. Thanks for listening. Now, go and implement. We'll see you next time. Did you run through doors till you hit the floor? Did you read my